Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to have you here as we get started with our event today. We are live streaming, so I want to make sure that those um, several hundred guests that are online are also able to enjoy uh, all of our conversation this morning. Um, so nice to have you here in Scott Hall on CMU's campus in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Anna Siefkin. I'm the executive director for the Wilton E. Scott Institute for Energy Innovation here on campus, and we serve as the hub for energy activity and research on campus. So first I want to say thank you. We have many distinguished guests who are here with us today in person. We will be doing many introductions, but I do want to thank in particular um, uh, President Jahanian, who is here, um, Valerie Carplus from the university, as well as uh, Director Whitaker, who's also here, County Executive Ritz Fitzgerald, um, one of our Board of Advisors members, um, Michael McQuaid, um, and last but certainly not least, Ernie Muniz. So as we get started this morning, I think it's critically important for us to think about the world in which we live. Uh, decarbonization is becoming an important, a critically important um, area of interest, not only for research, but for industry. And we think that it's very important that this conversation is happening here in Pittsburgh today. So without further ado, I want to get right into our conversation. Um, I did mention that we are here as the hub, so we have the partnerships and research for energy on campus. Uh, our agenda today um, is robust. Uh, we will be here for about an hour and a half, so I'm so glad to have so many of you here in person and online. Um, we will first have a few introductions, as I mentioned. Um, we are going to have an overview of the Roosevelt Project. Uh, then we'll have some specifics um, around the Southwest Pennsylvania case study, uh, sort of the interim report, which is available on cmu.edu forward slash energy now. Um, and then we're going to do some question and answer uh, with our distinguished guests. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jay Whitaker, the director of the Scott Institute. Thank you, Jay. Thank, thank you, Anna. And I would be remiss before I say anything else uh, uh, without thanking Anna and the staff uh, uh, here at, at the Scott Institute and also at, uh, within the president's office and also within the events uh, office here at CMU to make this happen. It's not easy to get this many people in a room uh, on campus. And this is the first time I certainly have uh, been part of something like this at the Scott Institute for a very long time. So it's such a pleasure. Welcome and thank you. Um, I also don't want to take up very much time. I just will say what you see right here is our charter. The Scott Institute is supposed to be bringing people from across the region and across the country to make this happen, right? We represent uh, 160 to 170 energy researchers on campus. We do everything from technoeconomic modeling to policy to economics to deep engineering and deep science. Uh, and we work together in a very interdisciplinary way. Uh, and so we are just so gracious to be able to, to participate in, in this dialogue today and also to help move the region forward. It's, uh, it's just a fantastic pleasure. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce the president of Carnegie Mellon University, Dr. Farnam Jahanian. He's a nationally recognized computer scientist, entrepreneur, and public servant, and higher education leader. Dr. Jahanian has been a champion for CMU in all things energy, environment, and climate and is also extremely interested in nurturing local innovation. So the kinds of things we're talking about today, the regional aspect of the development of this new uh, sort of generation of energy, climate, and workforce technology. Uh, and it's, it's so fantastic to have him here with us today. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Farnam Jahanian. Well, good morning, everyone. Jay, thank you very much for your kind words and also for your leadership of the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. Uh, let me echo Jay and Anna's warm welcome <clears throat> to all of you as we convene here today on CMU campus for this important discussion. And Anna, again, thank you for your leadership as well. I want to extend a special welcome uh, to several friends and elected officials who are joining us today. Uh, Congressman Mike Doyle, who's here virtually with us, will introduce him shortly. County Executive Rich Fitzgerald, and I believe Mayor Bill Peduto, who's joining us as well. I also want to take a moment to welcome our honored guest, Dr. Ernie Moniz. 
happy to have you here, Dr. Moniz. Thank you for your inspiring leadership and outstanding record of service to this nation and also on behalf of the entire CMU community. Welcome back to Southwestern Pennsylvania and welcome back to CMU campus. I think we just spoke a few minutes ago and, and uh, Ernie mentioned that he hadn't been back here since he stepped down as secretary, so we're happy to have you back on our campus. We're also joined here uh, in person and virtually by industry and nonprofit leaders, government officials and researchers from not only Carnegie Mellon, but also University of Pittsburgh, Penn State, MIT, Harvard, and a number of other institutions. I am delighted to see Dr. Jerry Cohen here with us, uh, President Emeritus of Carnegie Mellon, who was also a former director of the Scott Institute with a long, outstanding uh, uh, career also of research in this area that we're going to be talking about. I'm especially thrilled to welcome and thank Valerie Karpolis for her leadership role uh, in this initiative. Valerie, you're a new member of our faculty. Welcome aboard. Happy to have you here. I think we're all looking forward to the ways that you're going to shape the Roosevelt Project's impact here in southwestern Pennsylvania and also to the many contributions that I know you're going to make as a member of our faculty. Welcome aboard, Valerie. As you just heard, thanks to the work of the Scott Institute and expertise across, research, across our campus, CMU, is applying its research expertise at the nexus of technology and policy uh, to aid society in transitioning to a sustainable, low-carbon energy future. Our impact has been made possible through collaborations. Actually, that's what Jay and Anna were referring to with countless stakeholders, uh, many represented in this room and also virtually with us. They include partners, of course, from the private sector, academia, foundations, and the national labs, particularly the National Energy Technology Laboratory that's led by Brian Anderson uh, in our region with whom CMU has had a long and very productive relationship. These partners over the years have been instrumental in developing green building technology, transforming brownfields, funding and supporting dozens of energy-related spin-outs and leveraging AI and machine learning for new clean energy and decarbonization technologies. Uh, while a lot of terrific and exciting progress has been made over the years, important work still remains. At this critical juncture in particular, southwestern Pennsylvania, uh, which historically had been at the forefront of, in the past, uh, steel, chemical, and transportation manufacturing, is poised to demonstrate that effective region-wide solutions to energy challenges do exist and can create growth and opportunity. The Roosevelt Project Southwestern, Southwestern Pennsylvania case study outlines a holistic approach for how to get there underscoring close alignment among diverse group of stakeholders and strategies built around the unique strength and opportunities of our region. Uh, by coming together, our hope is that we'll be better positioned to ensure our energy transition that's going to create jobs and, and include everyone, including the most vulnerable in our society that are going to be able to participate in a clean and resilient economy. In just a few minutes, you're going to hear from uh, Dr. Moniz and you're going to hear from a distinguished panelist, panel of experts who are going to discuss essentially how to advance this vision. CMU, of course, is delighted to be a key partner in this project, is committed to strengthening the collaborative ecosystem that's needed for this energy transition in the coming years. Uh, here in southwestern Pennsylvania, we're also so fortunate to have had elected officials who are committed to the development of clean energy policy for the nation. Uh, before we turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Moniz and, and the panel, I'm delighted to invite several uh, leaders to speak, just briefly, beginning with Congressman Doyle, who is jointly, uh, who's joining us virtually. I assume Congressman Doyle is here virtually. I'm just assuming. Oh, there he is. I see him now on the screen. Um, uh, let me just say a few words about uh, Mike. As a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, Congressman Doyle has been at the forefront of all major energy policy innovations, including advocating for clean fossil energy and strategies for climate change. He's been a champion for Pittsburgh position as a world leader in green building technology and green capital 
chemistry. He has worked hard to ensure that energy research innovation translates into real opportunities and better quality of life for all Pittsburgh. He's a great friend of Carnegie Mellon and spends a good bit of time on our campus. We're so fortunate to have Mike Doyle representing uh, Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon, of course. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to one of Pittsburgh's greatest natural resources, Congressman Mike Doyle. Mike, take it away. Well, Farnham, thank you uh, very much for those kind words. And, and I want to echo your uh, welcome to my friend and uh, uh, former Secretary of Ener Energy, uh, Ernie Muniz, who uh, was just, just a, a great leader in that department. And I've enjoyed uh, the time I had working with Ernie. It's good to see him back here in Pittsburgh. Uh, and, and just thanks everyone uh, for having me here today. This is a a very exciting discussion about how our region can not only take advantage of, but become a leader uh, in a low carbon future. Uh, you know, although Southwestern Pennsylvania region, we've seen a lot of changes over the last few decades. One thing has remained constant. Uh, the region is a powerhouse of energy development. We have world leaders in the natural gas sector, world leading nuclear power companies and some of the most cutting edge research being done on innovative technologies for carbon capture, nuclear energy and renewable energy at the National Energy Technology Laboratory as well as CMU and the University of Pittsburgh. We also have both a growing tech industry and the historical manufacturing capability the region's been known for. We can combine all of these unique elements to chart a path forward to a cleaner and economically prosperous future. Using the region's growing advanced manufacturing experience, we can better make components for solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, and more. We can have a base of industrial companies that can transition using natural gas or hydrogen to decarbonize their facilities and we have affordable natural gas to make clean hydrogen with the help of researchers and engineers at the NETL and CMU. We have all the resources to be able to grow a manufacturing, produce more energy and become a leader in clean energy production as well as clean product production. So that's why I'm very excited to, about what we're working on in Congress. As, as many of you may have heard, Congress has agreed on a bipartisan infrastructure bill and the House and Senate are working on a larger Build Back Better reconciliation bill. Both of these would make large scale investments needed to realize the future that this study lays out. You know, there are three components to this puzzle that we're trying to tackle. First is building domestic supply chains. The second is the incentives to make more clean energy and develop technologies to clean up existing sources. And the third is ensuring end users have affordable clean energy fuels. For supply chains, we have seen this pandemic, uh, during this pandemic, how reliant we are on foreign supply chains. For critical components, we cannot continue this trend. That is why we're investing in domesticating semiconductor manufacturing. It is why I've worked to include a program to help manufacturers make battery components domestically in an infrastructure bill. And it's why I'm working to do the same for solar components. We need to have a robust domestic supply chain or both our economic and national security are at risk. Here in Western Pennsylvania, we have the facilities to do this and the advanced manufacturing renaissance already underway to make us a leader in this area. The reconciliation bill the House drafted includes billions for clean energy incentives. We need these to ensure we continue building renewable energy sources, but also to ensure that newer technologies like carbon capture and hydrogen production can realize their full potential to help decarbonize the economy. And lastly, we need to work with the different sectors, especially energy intensive and hard to decarbonize sectors like steel and cement making. This means investing in the infrastructure needed to help these industries decarbonize. That is why I was proud to work with Senator Manchin to get hydrogen hubs included in the infrastructure bill. This will allow us to use our abundant resources to create cheap, clean energy for use in other industries and helping Southwestern Pennsylvania become a leader in clean manufacturing. Now, of course, all this growth will require a robust and trained workforce 
and I will continue to support the many workforce training programs in the area and work to ensure that we have strong training programs, especially for those in disadvantaged communities, and that the jobs of the future are good paying career sustaining jobs for everyone. I'm excited about the future of this region and all of the opportunities that are ahead. And I look forward to working with you all to realize the future that will be laid out here today. I wanna to thank CMU and the Scott Institute for inviting me. And now with, uh, it gives me great pleasure to turn this over to one of my good friends uh, and a true champion for our region, our County Executive, Rich Fitzgerald. Thank you, Rich, it's yours. Thank you, Mike. And uh, let me echo uh, Farnham's words. Uh, Congressman Doyle truly is a natural resource that we have here. Uh, and the work he's been able to do in Washington, uh, in Congress, for many, many years has been groundbreaking. And when it comes to the innovation of uh, whether it's robotics or AI or the things he's been able to do, particularly as the chairman uh, of the subcommittee on communication and technology, we're very lucky, lucky to have Mike. We're also very lucky to have this great university uh, to be part of it. Uh, Farnham, thank you. Anna, thank you. The Scott Institute and what you continue to do uh, is groundbreaking, and you're going to continue to do groundbreaking thing. And I'm glad to see my friend Jerry Cohen is here, uh, keeping him active and keeping him uh, in his retirement. Uh, the things Jerry did, uh, again, when I took office 10 years ago, getting us on this path that leads us in a good direction. Uh, we have two existential threats right now that I think we're wrestling with uh, as a nation and, 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 quite frankly, the worldwide community. One is a pandemic and the other is climate change. Um, that, and, and on both of these, we have some folks that don't want to acknowledge that either one of them exists. But we're grateful that in our region, that not only do we believe in science, but places like CMU make my job easier to, to move forward on both of these issues. You know, we've been a heavy manufacturing uh, community for many, many years. Um, and, and again, if we're going to move and continue to have those jobs and continue to make things in this country, we know that decarbonization, we know that reducing, you know, CO2 and methane emissions are critical to how we move forward. Um, on the other end of things, down the street, you know, what, what the University of Pittsburgh uh, has been able to do with vaccine trials, et cetera, has also put us in good stead. The fact that over 80% of our adult population has been vaccinated puts us in a very, very safe condition. But now we're going to be relying on what's going to, going to go on here when it comes to that other existential threat um, uh, of our climate. Um, we need to continue moving forward. And I know this great university, which has been doing things uh, along these lines for many years, will continue along those lines. Mr. Secretary, we're delighted to have you back when you were here just a few years ago as Secretary, uh, signing a groundbreaking uh, agreement with, with all of us in this community. It was wonderful. We're gl also glad to uh, Welcome, Valerie Karpolis, and the work you're going to be doing, you couldn't come to a better place. I will tell you that right now for lots of reasons, not just this great university, but this great community that really embraces uh, the technology and the groundbreaking things that happen uh, at this university. Uh, again, we're very fortunate that, that we've got uh, such a great institution uh, doing these type of things under Farnham's leadership and, and, and the folks throughout this community uh, that are going to continue to do groundbreaking things to make Pittsburgh and southwestern Pennsylvania that really the groundbreaking place to, to deal with decarbonization. So thank you for being here. Looking forward to the, to the discussion. Now let me turn it over to uh, President Johanian as well. Thank you. So Mayor Bill Peduto is on his way. In fact, he'll be coming through that door in just a minute. So I'm going to add just a minute where I want to tell you about how to ask questions today. So during our panel, we're using an app called Slido. So that means everyone in the room, as well as everyone who's watching us virtually, will be able to go onto this website. You type in, you don't have to download anything. You type in slido.com. You enter SWPACMU, and that actually will you can, you can put a question in. Uh, we'll receive those questions, and as they come in, we'll be able to archive them as well. And so with that, Dr. Jahanian. All right. Okay. Anna, you did a great job. I thought you were going to start telling jokes for a bit <laughs> to stall. But anyway, um, 
First of all, Congressman Doyle and County Executive Rich Fitzgerald, both, as I mentioned, great friends of university. Thank you for your remarks and for your continued leadership in fueling innovation in Pittsburgh and across our region. At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce the man who initiated the Roosevelt Project, and, and he's a public servant with a long record of achievement, and all of you know, Dr. Ernest J. Moniz. Dr. Moniz was the 13th U.S. Secretary of Energy, serving under President Barack Obama from May of 2013 to January of 2017. As Secretary, he advanced energy technology innovation, enabling cutting edge capabilities for the American scientific research community and placed energy science and technology innovation at the center of the global response to climate change. <clears throat> Dr. Moniz is the Cecile and Ida Green Professor Emeritus of Physics and Engineering Systems at MIT and a special advisor to the MIT president. He's also the CEO of the nonprofit Energy Futures Initiative. Ernie has testified before Congress, huge number of accomplishments, too many to enumerate, uh, but he's been very impactful on the advance <clears throat> on the importance of issues related to energy and climate change. In fact, in this past April, I had a pleasure of testifying with Dr. Moniz regarding the need for increased federal support for science and research. During the virtual hearing that we held, uh, Dr. Moniz laid out his compelling vision for the national energy innovation ecosystem that can lead to broad-based economic growth. Uh, Dr. Moniz is one of the most influential voices shaping energy policy today, and we're so pleased to host him here at Carnegie Mellon and to discuss the Roosevelt Project's action plan for Southwest uh, Pennsylvania. Please join me in extending a warm welcome. We're going to move forward, Ernie, for now, just to stay on time. It's okay. We're going to please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Ernie Moniz. Ernie, take the podium, please. We're improvising, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> the, uh, well, thank you, uh, President Jahanian, and uh, it's, it is great to be back at, uh, at CMU after a few years. Of course, the last year and a half have been a little bit strange, but uh, uh, good to be back here and see so many, so many friends. But also, um, it was great to see Mike Doyle again. Uh, actually, uh, I just want to say that with Mike, I started working with him uh, on regional energy issues uh, when I was undersecretary in the second Clinton administration. Uh, he may not want to acknowledge that he goes that far back, but uh, he does. And uh, uh, County Executive Fitzgerald uh, uh, mentioned our sig signing agreement but forgot the actual splicing of fiber optic cable uh, that, uh, that took place. And Mayor Perduto, I want to say that uh, we um, – we were here many times when I was secretary working together with uh, all the very creative, uh, I think, uh, initiatives here in Pittsburgh uh, involving uh, economic development, uh, energy, but also I really want to uh, recall uh, the work that we did together in terms of veterans initiatives uh, that uh, you, really helped, uh, you really helped spearhead. And uh, so anyway, th those were great, uh, great, uh, great efforts. And, uh, uh, appreciate it. Uh, turning to the um, to the Roosevelt Project, uh, let me just say a few words uh, uh, here about the origins of the project and uh, what it uh, what it kind of represents. Uh, when, when I when I was secretary, an, another of the initiatives that we really emphasized was very very strong focus on jobs, uh, and in particular working with our uh, labor uh, colleagues. Uh, I immediately pilfered the founding executive director of the uh, Blue Green Alliance, uh, for example, uh, working uh, uh, on the jobs. And uh, the main thing uh, with regard to the Roosevelt Project is I think this just brought home uh, so clearly uh, the importance of addressing the energy transition uh, from the bottom up. Uh, from the uh, perspective of workers and communities uh, who we couldn't afford to strand. And I say that not only because it's the right thing to do, uh, 
but also because, frankly, if you're thinking about uh, accelerating the energy transition, uh, it's better to have uh, political tailwinds than the headwinds uh, that result from stranding uh, workers and, and communities uh, who might be very concerned about uh, their place uh, in the energy transition. Uh, so um, when I was uh, in California uh, uh, talking, working with the Emerson Collective, uh, headed by Lorene Powell Jobs, uh, major philanthropic uh, efforts that include community building and include addressing climate change. When I mentioned this kind of uh, confluence of factors, it was like immediately, well, let's do something. Uh, and that became the Roosevelt Project. And, uh, and the Roosevelt Project uh, uh, is, is named, I want to emphasize, uh, after three Roosevelts, not one. Uh, it's uh, Teddy Roosevelt for his commitment as president to the environment. It's Franklin Roosevelt for his commitment uh, uh, during the Depression in particular to, um, to building a middle class, uh, to creating jobs, to building American infrastructure, uh, and to Eleanor Roosevelt for her uh, consistent contributions to social justice uh, questions. Because those are really the three threads that come together uh, in the Roosevelt Project um, uh, in looking again at this uh, kind of bottom-up uh, bottom approach. Now, that begs the question, then, what is the Roosevelt Project? And what we did is we, we assembled uh, uh, faculty, students, uh, staff uh, from MIT and Harvard, and now I would add Carnegie Mellon uh, uh, with, uh, with Valerie, uh, and um, structured the project in two, in two ways. Uh, first, uh, we started with a set of what's kind of more academic-like, uh, some white papers uh, that cut across uh, various issues that would be uh, important to understand as a foundation, uh, things like uh, what was the history of previous industrial transitions uh, in terms of the kinds of questions that we are uh, asking. Uh, uh, what about infrastructure development, workforce uh, development? Uh, what about industrial policy? Uh, which, again, used to be bad words, but now, frankly, uh, to be honest, I think uh, with, me with, uh, with the, uh, the rise of the, Ch of the Chinese economy uh, providing a lot of pressure towards rethinking how we promote key industries, uh, how we uh, uh, solidify uh, supply chains for, uh, for, for security and, and resilience uh, and the like. So there was a period of, of doing that, and those papers are all posted on the website. But that was all prologue to what we considered from the beginning to be the real core of the project. Uh, and that was, uh, we ended up with four uh, regional case studies, uh, drilling down at, in four different places uh, that naturally had a concern about their, their place in the energy transition, mainly because their economies in particular uh, were strongly dependent or are strongly dependent uh, on, if you like, the current energy system uh, which, is in, uh, which is in flux. I should say, I should have said it perhaps at the beginning, that, uh, that we start from the, uh, I would say, recognition, some might say assumption, uh, that uh, we are heading to a low carbon uh, uh, energy economy. Uh, I would argue that there is uh, clearly uncertainty in terms of the pace and the scope, uh, but that it is inevitable that we are going there. And if I had to, uh, you know, say two words as to why uh, I could say a few more words, but the first two words as to why uh, I certainly feel very confident in that it's called weird weather. Uh, and uh, that has really changed the discussion, changed the public's, uh, the public's view. Uh, I, I like to say it's maybe not the nice, the most delicate thing to say, but, uh, you know, if you go back, um, go back to, let's say, let's pick, 2009, when the 
Waxman-Markey legislation on climate was going through, uh, going through the Congress. What I would say is then uh, a, a, fr a frequent and by demonstration relatively ineffective argument uh, for addressing climate uh, was that it was uh, really important for our grandchildren. Uh, it was certainly true, uh, but as I said, I think proved to be a pretty ineffective argument. Whereas today, weird weather has brought it home that it's about us too. Uh, and uh, it may be a sad commentary that that may be a more effective argument uh, uh, in terms of the kinds of adaptation and, and costs that we are seeing all around us um, uh, and, and the need to go forward. There are many other factors, uh, in particular the role of business, but uh, we'll just uh, move on from there uh, to say that again, the case studies uh, were, are the core, and the reason is our deeply held conviction that there is no single solution uh, that will be seen in different parts of our country or in different parts of the world. The solutions will be highly localized and regional, uh, drawing upon the assets, addressing the challenges that one sees specifically in those regions. So, in fact, if beyond any of the specifics, that come out of the Roosevelt Project in any of the case studies or in all of them in the aggregate. Uh, I think the most important message is to hammer home this idea of regional approaches to the solutions to the energy transition. Uh, that is, I think, the most important thing. There are other important uh, pieces of the framework like building uh, political coalitions, uh, absolutely essential, broad political coalitions, various other factors, but again, regional solutions I view as the most important. Uh, we chose, uh, again, the four case studies uh, in the Gulf Coast region, uh, in New Mexico, uh, in the upper Midwest uh, in terms of the uh, uh, transition from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles, and of course, Southwest Pennsylvania uh, as uh, four examples, all different uh, uh, as to why uh, uh, they had uh, these, th there were opportunities here to address the transition in ways that don't leave stranded workers or stranded communities, but brings everybody along into this low carbon, uh, low carbon future. The, um, uh, you'll hear more about the specifics uh, of, the, of the case study uh, uh, from, from Valerie. Let me also note that um, uh, and we had a little discussion of this earlier uh, this morning, that uh, clearly uh, a place like uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, I would throw in my own uh, little engineering school, MIT, uh, um, uh, Harvard now has their engineering aspirations. Uh, but uh, the, <laughs> but uh, uh, you can ask Steve about that during the panel. Uh, but, um, but, but clearly, uh, 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 and Farnham mentioned in the introduction that, you know, in 2015 at the Paris meeting, uh, I would say my particular role was in fact promoting uh, technology innovation as core to the solutions uh, to, uh, to the energy transition and, and climate change. Uh, but I do want to emphasize, and, and Carnegie Mellon does make and will make great contributions there, but also uh, I think will make uh, contributions, and I call on this institution and the others that I mentioned and many beyond there to really look at integrating the uh, technological innovation with the policy innovation uh, and, uh, uh, and the business model innovation uh, that uh, all must work together if we are to accelerate uh, the en energy transition successfully, again, while bringing everyone, uh, everyone along, the uh, in in approaching this uh, this work of the Roosevelt Project, uh, we did do um, a num uh, a set of, of economic modeling uh, efforts, uh, both to look at the uh, national level and to look at each of the four case studies. Uh, I would just mention that that economic modeling showed the importance of that integration of these different innovation paths. So for example, it was when specific policy initiatives, which we kind of guessed at, you know, 
a couple of years ago. Um, it turns out, well, we're certainly very good for government work. Uh, uh, for example, we had uh, we assumed a 10-year, one and a half trillion dollar infrastructure bill uh, would get passed. Well, it's 1.2 trillion right now, the bipartisan uh, bill. We assumed that there would be uh, a significant build out of the. EV supply chain, if you like, battery manufacturing. And we're seeing a gigafactory a month announced, it seems, uh, in, in, in the United States. So those were part of our uh, framing. And the big point here is that it was when the policy overlay was put in that the transition impact on total jobs in the United States by mid-century flipped from negative to positive 1.6 million. So it's really, again, bringing those technology elements and those uh, policy elements, and I would add to that the business model ele elements uh, that, is, that, is so, that is so critical. And I think that's another message, kind of big macro message, that I hope will be, uh, will be understood as coming out from this, uh, from this effort. Uh, certainly, I'm very hopeful that the infrastructure and reconciliation bills in the Congress right now, in some form of the latter, uh, do pass because, uh, again, they will be critical in, uh, in guiding uh, this, uh, this, uh, this transition uh, and uh, making sure that we have this, uh, again, as a major positive on things like, uh, like jobs. Finally. Again, I'm going to leave the, uh, uh, the discussion of the case study to uh, mainly uh, to Valerie, but I'll just add one piece, which I think, again, is an important characteristic of this and of other case studies, but, but particularly here in southwest Pennsylvania, uh, and that is that one really needs to address the challenges of the near, mid, and long term. Uh, uh, in the near term, uh, the, where one definitely has to have a strong focus on uh, the capabilities of the current workforce to be contributing uh, in, this, in this transition, make sure, again, that high-quality jobs are, are sustained in this period. The case study comes out essentially with a very, very strong focus on the tremendous environmental remediation, uh, uh, old wells being capped, addressing methane emissions, which is a huge greenhouse gas uh, challenge, that there's a, a whole structure there. It's got to have a policy uh, government uh, support uh, drivers, uh, but it's accomplishing real stuff and accomplishing uh, the jobs transition that we need at the same time that we're not waiting for a linear approach we're working in parallel to develop the new kinds of opportunities that will be so important, like carbon capture and sequestration, like blue hydrogen, uh, 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 which can provide a foundation uh, uh, that has to be built in this decade to scale in the next and the, and the succeeding uh, decades. So I think it's that kind of focus with people coming together, again, building the coalitions to get that regional solution put in place. And there I'll just say that we are we at Energy Futures Initiative, with our labor partners from AFL-CIO, uh, uh, we are really pleased to be working again in this region with partners here into market. I'll mention particularly uh, some of the companies, uh, U.S. Steel and other, other companies, um, uh, coming together to really focus on uh, a hydrogen hub. Uh, Mike Doyle mentioned that he had worked with Senator Manchin to put this in place. It's terrific. I mean, as an example, it's, it's $8 billion uh, over five years to seed uh, the building of four regional hydrogen hubs in this country. And we ran a, we ran a workshop uh, 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 in the summer uh, on a Ohio River Valley hub and it's clear, boy, again, this matches. The assets are here uh, uh, to do that. Um, so I think coming together, uh, having that social fabric uh, uh, stitched even more tightly uh, will, uh, will, I think, lead to success 
uh, in that. And that's exactly the kind of initiative we need in this decade to get the foundation laid uh, for, for, for going forward. So a lot of stuff is coming together. I'm, I'm really excited about it, and I think the, uh, and I hope that the Roosevelt Project uh, case study in particular uh, will, um, uh, you know, will help all of you uh, in, your, uh, in your planning uh, going forward. Uh, and indeed, I should, I should have said something earlier, and I will end with this, that um, uh, with all of the case studies, and certainly specifically with this case study, uh, w you know, we on the banks of the Charles River uh, uh, could not do it without having uh, forged very, very strong relationships with major teams that are, in fact, in the region, in the locality, uh, because uh, if we didn't do that, we would be, be belying our fundamental assumption <laughs> that it is, in fact, uh, knowing how to use the local assets and address the local challenges uh, that will be the most important determinant of success uh, going forward. So uh, thank you for all for coming, and uh, uh, thanks. Many of you here were part of that advisory group, and, and, and uh, thank you for that. And, um, and as, as we said, we don't think we're finished not only with, with this report, but with the work that needs to be done uh, to, to, to realize the gains that we envision. So thank you. Thank you, Secretary Moniz. Um, as you mentioned, and an important part of this is the assets are here. Um, we are, it is a regional approach that is so important to us in terms of what our future looks like. And there has been no greater champion than our mayor um, who is joining us today. I'd like to give him the opportunity to make a few words if he would come forward and uh, join us today. Thank you, Anna, and uh, Mr. Secretary, it's wonderful to have you back in Pittsburgh. One of the uh, initiatives you didn't mention was a first-of-its-kind MOU that we created between the Department of Energy and the City of Pittsburgh in order to be able to look at micro-energy districts in a different way. And let me just tell you what, what, what happened with that. We were then able to start to work with private corporations from building off of that and uh, just last week finalized deals for uh, over 100 year old system that has powered our downtown. We then looked and created a partnership with the city of Aarhus uh, over in Denmark which is fully f uh, powered by MicroPower in order to be able to create a model for the city of Pittsburgh to eventually become uh, powered on a micro district and we have uh, partnered with the university down the street the University of Pittsburgh in their Swanson School of Engineering in order to be able to look as uh, using our city as an urban lab and finding different ways in order to be able to do so which then led into the idea of how can we start to be able to look at our city as the example of using hydrogen and the transition from blue hydrogen to green hydrogen. And not only the transition from blue hydrogen to green hydrogen, but how can we bring companies in that will invest into Pittsburgh to build the solar panels here that will be the providers of the solar energy that will be the backhaul for the green hydrogen? And how can we make the solar fields in areas like Somerset and Fayette County, in land that has been decimated by coal mining, which has very little value now, and be able to make it profitable and be able to help our neighbors that have very little value in that land and be able to make it profitable. And how can we create an ecosystem in an area that is dependent upon fossil fuel to be able to make an area that can be valued into a 21st century energy model. Here's the argument. The argument is very simple, that we have the ability to be able to utilize the transmission power, 
the capacity of what we have built over 150 years and the communities and the people and the capacity of the capital that we have right here in Northern Appalachia and the Ohio Valley to be able to build out a renewable energy future more so than areas in other parts of the country. And that if we make our commitment built towards the future and not the past, this becomes the most competitive area of the nation in order to make that happen. And it's not something that is just being talked about. The Marshall Plan for Middle America shows in data that if we do nothing, if we just stand with the status quo, this region of Northern Appalachia in the Ohio Valley in the next 10 years will lose four, or I'm sorry, 100,000 jobs. 100,000 jobs we are going to lose, 40,000 of which will come from West Virginia. If we stand with Senator Manchin's plan, 40,000 West Virginians will lose their jobs. My brother lives in West Virginia. My sister-in-law lives in West Virginia. My dad graduated college in West Virginia. Two of my brothers graduated college in West Virginia. 40,000 West Virginians are set to lose their jobs just by doing nothing. If we invest in the Marshall Plan for Middle America, we will gain 400,000 jobs in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. The Marshall Plan for Middle America, and you can Google the report, which was done in conjunction with the University of Pittsburgh's Katz School of Business, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Columbia University, looks at an investment that comes from federal funds, comes from investment of pension funds from local governments and from labor unions, and comes from tax abatements from state governments, just like we have given tax abatements to fossil fuel companies, and puts that investment into clean energy and green technology. You talk, and it, it's supported by the mayors of nine northern Appalachian cities in partnership with the universities of those cities from Huntington, West Virginia and Marshall University, from Morgantown and West Virginia University, from Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon, University of Pittsburgh, from Youngstown and Youngstown State, Dayton and the University of Dayton, Columbus, Ohio State, Athens and Ohio University, Youngstown and Youngstown State, Cincinnati University of Cincinnati, Dayton and the University of Dayton, Louisville and the University of Louisville. The understanding that the future economy is based upon the ability of working with those existing companies that were built upon the fossil fuel industry and helping them, not fighting them, in order to be able to make the transition to a renewable future. And being able to work with the universities in order to be able to make the innovation and the investment necessary to make that transference happen. Look, it's very simple. There are two paths to the future. There's the path of those that will get it, and there's the path of those that will be left behind. The question is, is whether Northern Appalachia and the Ohio Valley will choose to be those that will fight and be left behind, or whether we will choose to work together instead of fight each other, and will be those that will get it and will help to lead other post-industrial regions around the world to do and follow that same model. I feel so fortunate that I got to listen to you, Mr. Secretary, in understanding that this is not an us versus them model. This is not a Green New Deal of where we have to flip a switch and punish companies that have built communities and punish the workers who have built America. But instead, we can bring them to the table and we can help them to restore those communities and assure their families 
that there will be an opportunity for their children to flourish in the towns that their parents built and in the jobs that they created. Thank you, Mayor Peduto. Um, and now I want to uh, to pivot and talk a little bit about our new colleague, uh, Dr. Valerie Carplus. So as we've talked about with the secretary and we've talked about with the mayor, there is an all of the above strategy that we can employ in southwestern Pennsylvania and in other regions of the country that can be a model. And so with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Valerie, Dr. Valerie Carplus, who's gonna walk us through some slides. Terrific. Thank you so much, Anna, for the introduction and to everyone here from Pittsburgh for the absolutely wonderful and warm welcome. I am thrilled to be here um, to join the faculty in the Engineering and Public Policy Department where we do uh, not just the technology innovation but also, as uh, Secretary Moniz pointed out, the policy innovation and the business model innovation. Um, and so uh, many of my faculty colleagues are here today um, working also closely with the Scott Institute. I think we um, are, are truly excited to consider today the beginning of a broader conversation and an opportunity um, to connect with all of you and with the diverse and uh, energetic efforts and voices of this region. Today I'm going to uh, all too briefly uh, for time go through uh, the findings of the Southwest Pennsylvania case study. This case study is a broad effort. It is a an both interdisciplinary but it is also multi-institutional. And so the case leads, uh, Steve uh, is going to come up uh, in a moment and join me to answer all the hard questions, admittedly. Um, and um, I, I also want to highlight that we have um, uh, um, Professor Kathy Arroyo from Boise State University and Dustin Tingley at Harvard, um, both who are not here but are also uh, lead faculty on this study. And we have a terrific team. Um, Liz Tom is here, a PhD candidate at Harvard. Um, in government, and uh, we have a number of undergraduate RAs who you see up here. Um, uh, Allison, Heidi, and Iran were uh, instrumental in putting together this first draft of the report. Now, who's not up here? It's really all of you, right? The voices from the region, the, the voices of elected officials, as well as those who are working on the ground to develop projects and processes and make connections that were not previously made. And so as we were working on this report, one of the most tremendous realizations at the end was that actually a lot of these conversations, a lot of what we were beginning to, to see and recommend was actually being realized. And over the past two weeks, I joined the Marshall Plan for Middle America Summit, which was a uh, a really exciting instance of how you have diverse communities coming together and connecting around uh, projects that address workforce, uh, emissions reduction, um, revenue generation, all of the different uh, pieces of the puzzle that we're going to need to get right in order to move the transition forward. So uh, as background, so this is a, uh, on the right you can see a picture of uh, the state's natural resources, aside from those who are here in this room, uh, were introduced earlier, or um, in Congressman Doyle's case on Zoom. Uh, the, as you can, as I think we're all well aware, uh, Pennsylvania sits on a golden egg from the perspective of its natural resource wealth. The counties that we focused on in the study, um, overlay with this picture, uh, are the 13 counties here in the southwestern part of the state. Uh, as we did the study, we worked as hard as we could to think about the connections across state borders as well as uh, the broader uh, Appala Appalachian regional networks, um, which I think uh, we hope will come through, but is, is still um, part of the reason why this is a work in progress. Now, uh, in the region, there are several counties that are, um, in particular, Washington, Green, and Fayette that are um, heavily uh, specialized in uh, 
mining and extractive industry employment. So there is, uh, again, even within our region, a real diversity of interests and, uh, and uh, challenges. Now, on the other hand, uh, this is also a region that is becoming increasingly diverse. Uh, the top four industries in the region here are healthcare, retail, accommodation, food service, as well as manufacturing. Um, and this is light and heavy manufacturing. And so I think we're seeing that we need to think about all of these different interests as we chart the path forward, and in particular think about the challenges um, associated with the, the workers and the families that sit behind these slides and these pictures. And indeed, that was what our case set out to do. Now, uh, this is a complicated slide, which in a few words can be summed up as follows. So Pennsylvania, Southwest Pennsylvania has a very robust energy cluster. And that, is, uh, that means that there are uh, primary energy industries, which uh, feed into energy carrier industries, think electricity, that are then consumed by uh, both uh, fossil fuel energy consumers and metal, cement, petroleum product um, uh, production, and then electricity consumers uh, in chemicals, in metal product manufacturing, and we want to think about this entire value chain. Another piece that's really important is the supporting industries, right? So if we look at this picture, uh, you can see that there are, there are a set of workers that are directly connected with the primary energy industries, and then there are a range of industries that depend on low-cost energy and have indeed grown up around the fact that Pittsburgh offered low-cost energy uh, and, and the surrounding region. If we look at this in terms of greenhouse gases, you can see that, in fact, if we look at these industries, these, uh, the, the core elements of this energy cluster, here, we're not showing employment associated with the supporting industries and the consuming industries. Uh, that amounts to uh, about 10% of employment and about 20% of the region's economic output, just for those direct industries. It gets much bigger once you consider beyond manufacturing um, the, the supporting industries, and et cetera. And when we look at greenhouse gas emissions footprints associated with these activities, one of the two things to note, one is that uh, a major source of in-region emissions, direct emissions, is already under pressure as, um, as uh, coal plants close for economic reasons and, um, and uh, that starts to address those emissions. Of course, very importantly, those facilities will need clear transition plans and support. Now, if we look at the, at the top row, here, emissions associated with the natural gas that the regions export are, are massive. And this is where some of our proposals are really aimed at thinking through how to address the fact that Pennsylvania is actually a uh, resource that Southwest Pennsylvania is exporting is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions nationwide, and that makes the region vulnerable to low carbon transition in the rest of the world. Uh, as, uh, for example, carbon is priced or pressure uh, through industrial policy channels comes into play, that's going to be uh, very, uh, that, that will not depend on what happens in the region, that will depend on broader trends. So our recommendations emerging from the study can be divided into five categories. Uh, I'll start with environmental remediation. I'll talk about carbon management and fossil fuel resources. And I'll talk about clean energy and uh, economic diversification, particularly around manufacturing, workforce development, and then uh, economic planning and strategy. So uh, first of all, one of the, th and again, as I put these recommendations up, this is the beginning, not the end of this conversation. The report is in an interim draft state, and so uh, these are as much for discussion and hopefully our listening tour on the road to uh, the national rollout of the Roosevelt study, which will be happening later this fall. So uh, first of all, um, one of the, the main takeaways from the study is that uh, the region has an opportunity now to 
uh, to get past the false choice between the fossil and clean energy and really focus on economic diversification and opportunity for families and workers as the next big thing. As in the past, the next big thing has maybe been one industry or one uh, center of gravity. But here, how do we get as excited about the possibility of living in a diverse and connected society, not just in urban areas, but also in rural areas. Uh, and so in order to, to do that, the region can really has an opportunity to harness a dense network of regional, state, and local institutions um, and engage them, as is already happening, uh, in the discussions around energy transition. Second is just a flag that it's really important to think outside of cities. So uh, the regions that are going to be most vulnerable to a transition from fossil energy in this part of the country are actually some of the rural and peri-urban areas. And then third, there is a real need to have coordinated regional planning. And this can involve a range of actors. And we actually are really open to hearing from you. Is it some uh, flavor of the Marshall Plan community? Is it, uh, does it involve um, uh, chambers of commerce? Does it involve uh, regional or um, you know, small cities, satellite cities, their leadership and, uh, and participation? Now, the um, second group of recommendations was really around environmental remediation. And so here, there is a need to really invest using public funding at re reme uh, in remediation at scale and in the process, uh, employ uh, workers, in, uh, particularly in rural areas, in these, in these efforts. Some of these uh, abandoned wells are, are, have not been uh, revisited in decades. Um, and uh, they are an, a very important source of methane emissions, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And addressing this particular challenge has the possibility of addressing both climate change and workforce uh, opportunity at the same time. Now, uh, this will require a regulatory framework, so updating and enforcing bonding requirements to encourage third, and maybe, again, encouraging third party certification schemes, um, improving research capacity around this to detect, quantify, and track leaking wells, and then um, figuring out how to, how to develop dependable, uh, perhaps uh, private as well as public funding sources um, for remediation through uh, various mechanisms. And so this as it was identified as a major area for the region going forward. On carbon management was so the next uh, third big area. So here we see carbon management, which refers to carbon capture and storage, as well as its connection into uh, potential hydrogen hub ecosystems offers a path to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from industry. And here, business model innovation will be critical. So one of the recommendations in the study was to create a carbon management task force to plan and develop um, a carbon transportation and storage system. Uh, we also uh, see an opportunity now to innovate in this area. So uh, leveraging the resources we've heard about this morning, um, NETL, uh, as well as our uh, neighboring research institutions here and in the region uh, to not just tackle the technological innovation, but also the policy and regulatory innovation that will be needed to support this solution. And then uh, there is, in the report, we discuss uh, blue hydrogen, so natural gas, with carbon capture and storage as uh, an important area um, for research and as a possible path towards uh, greener sources of production. I think there is an opportunity now to lay the regulatory frameworks that will uh, make possible both blue and green hydrogen. Purple hydrogen also, mentioned nuclear here, um, important to see as well. Now on the clean energy side, there are a, a tremendous variety of exciting opportunities that I think this chart just begins to sort of lay out both the time dimensions, so vertically, near-term, long-term uh, of deployment potential, and then on the horizontal axis, we've uh, broadly or 
the stylized representation of whether this is more of an incremental impact on GHG emissions versus disruptive system impact. And so we see in the near term, uh, solar, onshore wind, HVAC, biogas, maybe even geothermal potential, um, uh, looking at nuclear plants as, as assets that can be used as a source of firm power and as an important uh, uh, anchor point for future uh, nuclear-related projects and, and innovation in the region. And then as we go um, uh, into these more sort of disruptive options, uh, I think it's important to recognize that offshore wind is not just a, is, is an interesting opportunity for the supply chain opportunities. So these aren't just technologies that can be developed and deployed locally, but those which the region with its tremendous manufacturing uh, capabilities can, um, can advance and participate in, um, especially uh, as these activities uh, increasingly become uh, uh, located here in this country. So uh, I'd like to now highlight just a couple of uh, enablers of, of the clean energy and manufacturing opportunities. One is uh, REGI and uh, some form of of carbon pricing could be a really important complement to the networks that are trying to come together and strengthen these uh, uh, and, and develop out, prove out some of these uh, opportunities for, uh, for solar, community solar, um, in particular here in the region. Uh, that would involve also passing clear rules that would allow interested communities to, to become more engaged in adoption. Um, if we think about hard to decarbonize industries such as steel, iron, and cement, there is a real opportunity here to be lead innovators, not just in the US, but in the world in these areas. Um, and so that's an er opportunity for local universities and national labs on R&D. Um, the uh, Southwest Pennsylvania's area leaders, including the um, Allegheny Conference on Community Development, I think has a very strong an uh, interesting role to play in uh, identifying supply chain opportunities that come, can come and keep those uh, supporting and, um, and uh, downstream uh, manufacturing industry jobs here and, and build that out. And then finally, Pennsylvania has historical strengths in nuclear. And this is, a, again, another opportunity um, uh, to to partner with various disruptive opportunities around hydrogen production, possibly even cryptocurrency mining, um, and low carbon steel. So I think, uh, again, the workforce issues here are, are really paramount. Um, the direct energy workforce is relatively small relative to the uh, workforce in the supporting and downstream industries. What I want to say by this is that it's going to be really important to think about the future for these workers. Uh, it's already being considered in the case of coal mining. And to the extent that we can find opportunities today that match with the skill sets, that is a big win. We want to be as inclusive as possible as we think about this future. At the same time, the indirect jobs also need to be supported, given that those are such a, a large share um, of uh, family wages and participation, um, workforce, workforce participation in the region. And so I think we are not just focused on jobs in numbers, but also job quality and uh, keeping, uh, an, as we think about how the region competes globally, should not come with a, a race to the bottom, but instead of thinking about how do we support good jobs? How do we mobilize the willingness to invest in those good jobs right here in the region. Um, and to support the workforce, just a couple of points here. Um, thinking about a, a more a connected regional council for career transitions. My own research, I'm very interested in thinking about workforce pathways, developing best practices for managing the transition, again, at the company and at various organizational levels in order to address the near-term uh, pain of some of the closures that are expected. And then finally, um, strengthening entrepreneurship and investment into rural areas. Uh, entrepreneurship ecosystems here are going to look different and are going to, to draw in a tremendous amount of energy um, uh, that will not look like 
entrepreneurship does on the coasts necessarily. But it's, I think, a very important area um, and place to focus. So finally, my very last slide, um, while the case study is wrapping up in the next couple of months, um, I'm here as within the case, the, the local partner, to really kick off a conversation and say that in some ways this conversation is, is already taking place and uh, I'm uh, excited to engage in that with all of you. Uh, there will be, an, there is an interim draft online, uh, over 100 pages, we welcome you to read it um, and we'd, be, we'd love to have you as part of our listening tour in the next phase. I also want to mention that we have tremendous resources here at CMU and uh, in um, our neighboring institutions, Pitt at Penn State, visited Penn State New Kensington uh, over the summer to see some of the terrific uh, developments that are going on there at the corner. Uh, so we want to build out this network and be part of what already exists. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, but um, we see, uh, I think, many ways that there are synergies in all of these efforts. And my group, um, which is the Laboratory for Energy and Organizations, or LEO, is going to really focus on sort of regional and business uh, organizational responses to the climate imperative and how to this generally helping leaders think about this question from a research perspective to do policy focused research on how do we get to net zero GHG emissions by mid century. And I am um, joined by an incredible cadre of my. my uh, fellow faculty members in, um, who have done, tr uh, you know, the reason I came to CMU was to work with them um, in advancing these questions. And so um, we're eager to, to help build and feed the network. Um, we are also uh, very grateful to uh, the individuals that we interviewed um, in government, industry, nonprofit, labor, and community organizations. And, and a very special thanks to all of the members of our advisory board. Um, to President Jahanian for his um, kind welcome, to uh, the leadership of the Scott Institute for allowing uh, these connections to come together, and um, case co-lead Steve, who's going to be up on stage with me, um, Mayor Peduto, um, and, um, and uh, Rich Fitzgerald, who I think had to leave. Uh, but it, the, I think we have, um, and obviously Congressman Doyle as well, I think we have a terrific uh, set of voices in this room, um, and I just hope that this will be a conversation we can take forward. Uh, and now I think we're going to assemble in the front uh, for a panel and look forward to your hard questions. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Karpless. So we, we do have a time for a few questions. So if you will use the Slido app that we talked about, Valerie, if you'll come up, and Stephen. Um, and we have about 15 minutes to run through some questions. So again, I will encourage all of us to, to keep our answers brief. And um, Secretary, if you would like to join us in answering any of these questions, please do. So with that, uh, Jay, do you want to kick us off? I would love to. Could you guys hear me? Are we on? Um, thank you very much uh, for a fantastic talk. And uh, Steve, maybe you could take just two seconds first before we get started. Just, who are you? Why are you here? Famous words to live by. Yes. Um, I'm Steve Ansala I'm a faculty member at Harvard University. I was at MIT for many years before that. Um, and I've been working with Ernie for about 20 years on various energy studies. Um, I helped coordinate this um, project and prepare the materials and also I'm going to call out Liz Tom, who's a PhD student in our department, um, who was instrumental in, in helping to organize the case and, and uh, spearhead the research. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I'm going to jump right into a question. We have, I think, probably quite a few accumulated online. And Anna is the voice of the people. Uh, and she will uh, step in with those in one second. Um, one of the things that's sort of an extension of accommodating and dealing with local workforce um, and you guys got started or worked on this sort of pre and during pandemic. And I'm wondering now, we're seeing this massive shift in preference and decision making amongst the US workforce. Many people are quitting their jobs, looking for other things and moving laterally, moving vertically. Um, one of the biggest problems that we see, especially as we go into some of the rural areas where we have all these opportunities, is a lack of people working, um, at least in the jobs that they have been working in. What does your work say about 
that paucity of, of interest in existing work uh, flow and whether or not this is an opportunity or a challenge or both? And well, I think both. Um, we've seen a lot of the challenges finding work, uh, especially in service industries. I think service has been hit especially hard. Yes. But not every industry's had that shortage. True. And some of the industries that are projected to grow from just about every model we looked at, there's some nice modeling from Princeton University that was important in our thinking, uh, is that a lot of growth is going to come in two areas. One is grid and the other is HVAC. There's going to be big boom areas everywhere in the United States, but it's especially here. And those are areas where um, you know, there's still a lot of job growth and a lot of um, uh, attraction of people into that, um, into that field. And it's also been an area where you can envision somebody transitioning pretty, pretty easily. Right. I would think it's an opportunity just based on sort of like the interest in folks moving to different sectors. And I think there's going to be a lot of growth. I have one last question, then we'll turn it to Anna. Um, and it could, any, any of you can answer it. But so of the many conclusions drawn, many of them were like, oh, that makes sense. I can see that. It seems like a reasonable pathway. Um, but I'm sure you encountered one or more sort of surprising or unusual twists. Um, pick, pick one. And what was the twist? And why was it most intriguing? I would say the, the importance of remediation. I think that and, and the opportunity. I, I don't think this scale came across very clearly. There are 400,000 abandoned wells in Pennsylvania. It's by far the biggest problem of abandoned wells in the United States. Um, and very little of it's due to fracking. These are old wells um, and old pipelines that are centuries old. And they aren't owned by anybody. And they aren't bonded. And they're not paid for. But uh, so, so, And I think that's also one of the problem areas to try to figure out how to finance um, that area. But there's a lot of interest in it and a lot of excitement. The other area that I'd say that there was just some real uh, heartwarming surprises were these um, people we encountered like Betsy McIntyre and Ken Snyder and um, uh, Brandon Dennison working in West Virginia who are really trying to solve these problems at a very local level and just how localized the problem solving has to be. When we come at it, as policy analysts, we often come in like, let's have a carbon tax or some sort of import fee or something, some sort of national policy that will just make everything work ma magically. But just the extent to which people need to be involved at this very local level, and there's so much space for innovation and employment programs, um, for education programs, uh, and for technology programs, I just thought that was just astonishing to see and just it came out immediately when we talked to people, just the range of very creative things going on. Perfect. Valerie, do you have any other? Yeah, I mean, just very briefly, I think, um, you know, in this country, I think we uh, don't uh, maybe appreciate enough the role that apprenticeships and uh, on-the-job training, um, how important that can be to, to really building skill sets and also uh, pride in hands work, which I think, you know, it's something that is not just this region, but across the U.S. in the context of the case studies we've seen um, could, could be tremendously important. And, and the jobs, well, to your first question, it's, it's partially about uh, creating, right. I think for, for those who are leaving the workforce, yes. they want to feel supported. Got it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Anna, what say the people? Um, so thank you. There are so many great questions that are coming in. I'm going to start with several that are around nuclear. So can you speak to the opportunities for nuclear? We need nuclear, environmental, and grid attributes. Will there be ITC, PTC, or some other policy solutions? So it's an insider there. Um, and a follow-on, what does the region's nuclear industry need to do to position itself for transition, and what policies support that? Wow, OK. So there's quite a lot there. I will uh, just say a couple of things. First of all, I think the opportunities are twofold. One is in uh, nuclear development. It could be small modular reactors. It could be, you know, uh, electricity generation for the state, um, uh, shoring up the existing nuclear plants. Spoke to a gentleman this morning who, who meets his carbon reduction obligations by purchasing credits from a nuclear power plant. So, I think there is an opportunity to to think about that as a as an option for firm power in the region. So, firm power that can balance and work together with renewable sources. Um, it's uh, natural gas does that well too. Um, but the, 
And then I think the other piece is that Pennsylvania has a tremendous supply chain opportunity. And there's this historic, uh, you know, long time uh, hub for manufacturing um, and for the nuclear industry. And there, I think there needs to be a closer look at opportunities there. You know, Steve, would you agree? Totally. You've got Westinghouse's long history here, and they've been anchor of the nuclear industry. And also even more upstream components. The whole, exactly. You know. So, yeah, yeah. nuclear is... And also nuclear is the single biggest electricity producer in the state right now because coal's declined sufficiently that nuclear is number one. So this is a... And this is the number two nuclear state in the United States. So this is a place where nuclear makes a lot of sense to take a close look at what its future ought to be. Sure, and the quiet, the quiet other lab here, Bettis, uh, that does basically small modular reactors for aircraft carriers, which is mostly secret. However, that technology is spilling over into SMR tech, and, and that's an obvious point of, like, a horsepower for people. Yeah. Um, the next little bundle of questions is around manufacturing, so get ready. Um, how can East Ohio, Southwest Pennsylvania, and Northern West Virginia align and execute on reshoring manufacturing for the electric vehicle and clean energy future? Plus, um, what does your study find out about how the about environmental policy, clean air and water might conflict with the manufacturing needs of that same region? Yeah, that's a, oh, well, Good there's questions. even more there. Yeah. Yes, great questions. Um, and I, I just, I, I will just bite off a small slice of that first one and then throw the baton to Steve. But the, I think one thing when it comes to sort of rebuilding manufacturing ecosystems and looking into opportunities that may be coming from the outside, it's, it's locally um, and um, in general, not just here, it's important not for those involved to, to, to plan effectively and coordinate and, and communicate with each other, not to work across purposes um, in the sense that, you know, there, as opportunities come along, I think there's there's a real um, kind of a, a you know a lot to be gained by creating new conversations and, and not duplicating efforts. Um, so the the lessons about uh, electric vehicle production or all all car manufacturing here are I think general to manufacturing in the region, period. And I think one of the areas where I think there's a weakness in the region, something that needs to be looked at very closely and addressed is venture capital for the development of manufacturing. Not just venture capital for intellectual property, which is pretty ample in the region, but the venture capital for the development of manufacturing is, we think, pretty weak. And it's an area that needs some real attention. Ready for the next? Yeah. So I'm going to name names. Josh Beck, who is a partner and good friend of the Scott Institute, wants to know, what is the long-term role of energy storage integration in the region? as a strategy to transition resiliency away from a peaked plant model? So look, I think, you know, uh, just like with the sort of broader picture, and this is actually probably a good question for Jay, honestly, but um, just, I think, you know, we want to think about innovation being needed in a range of different areas. And we're not sort of advocating one solution for the, to, to achieve uh, balancing of intermittent renewables, sort of thinking about innovation needs and with that I think you can yeah, speak just, to that just more. there's an interesting crossover between this this blue and green hydrogen conversation and storage um, there is a production tax credit um, bill working its way through now that's a Senate right now I'm not so sure exactly what its status is it's offering three dollars per kilogram produced um, hydrogen um, for a fairly long time and if people jump in and start to do this They'll have very low cost, if not free hydrogen, especially if you were, depending on the technology and the approach and the source of energy and so forth. Um, if that happens, uh, there's actually a, a, a high degree of likelihood that some of that hydrogen can be used to, to level intermittent renewables vis-a-vis -vis large form factor salt oxide fuel cells, other fuel cells, even combustion or cut combustion in, in turbines, which will take some pressure off of like very large batteries, which I think is an interesting blend. Mm. Uh, although we'll be challenging from some of these large battery companies now that are really placing a huge bet on that technology. So there's a really interesting crossover between the two. So let me pull out the, the hydrogen piece in particular and the cross state emphasis of the question which is you've got three states that are really kind of integral uh, and, or ought to be integral, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. And there's not enough of that kind of crossover. Like I've seen, you know, reports 
after report issued by different organizations who ought to be taking a regional approach where the report ends at the Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia border. It's just like, like there's, it's totally stovepiped and that needs to stop. Um, so that needs to be like a real focus is a regional focus. The Ohio River Valley is an excellent way to think about it. Also the, the area covered by nettle is another way to think about it. Um, so that's a really important premise of the question that there is a regional integration and there just needs to be more of it. The other piece of the, the hydrogen piece um, raises the qu a different kind of storage, which is the importance of underground storage. Um, and man, that is terra incognita, <laughs> quite literally. Um, the, the, one of the first sets of regulatory questions has got to be ownership questions on the underground universe. And th that's just like, it, Texas is going through it right now. Um, they're actually far ahead in a regulatory sense, but Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia are gonna need to sort out underground ownership questions and how storage is gonna work. So if you're storing hydrogen underground, who, who has access to it and who owns what hydrocarbons? Um, so before we invite the secretary back up to give us a few minutes, uh, sort of final parting thoughts, um, I'm gonna answer a softball question, which is, uh, who will be coming in 22 as speakers with the Scott Institute. And I wanted to say fantastic speakers just like today. Um, the last question is actually an opportunity for all three of you to give us um, a, a quick little note as your final parting thought. So which are the wicked problems impeding the energy, uh, the just transition to a clean and circular economy? So the case study framed many questions. Which ones are the wicked ones? And that's a good opportunity to say, what are you really looking forward to? So in Massachusetts, wicked means something very different than wicked here. Like we say wicked awesome. Um, you know, there are a lot of smaller problems. I wanna bring it back to the workforce issue because that's so important. And I think one of the most difficult problems is a kind of circularity problem. So you've got a worker who's in a coal mine and it's gonna get closed and he knows it. He can spend two years in a training program but he has no guarantee that he's got a job at the end of that. How do you break that cycle, right? How do you line up businesses who are committed to hiring that mine worker at the end of that two-year period? If you can solve that problem, you can solve a lot of problems for the region's workforce. If you can't solve that problem, it's going to be a very long slog. And uh, on my side, I guess I would, uh, you took a very good one, uh, Steve, but there are more, there, there are many. Um, and um, I'll just highlight the challenge of uh, regulatory frameworks for both hydrogen and carbon capture and sequestration. I think that's uh, something that I think m no state really has it figured out. I mean, I, was, I lived in Texas for 10 years, love them, but you know, I don't know that they have it figured out either. It's I think there's, orange, uh, that's true. <laughs> um, so I think that, that would, um, that's a big one. And the other is uh, creating diverse conversations it, because I think that's where the ideas start to flow and the sort of interesting, uh, the, the, we move beyond the false choice of uh, you know, clean versus fossil. It's really, it's a, it's a bigger um, opportunity than that. For me, it's the unknown between the, the market for the, the consumer preference and the decision for consumers in mass to completely shed fossil fuels and how that impacts an infrastructure build out um, and all the other parts, all, all the supply chain implications of this. There's a, a lot of predictions now of how massive uh, EVs are gonna be and how many battery plants we're gonna use and what, uh, how much material we're gonna need and this, the sort of the tension around domestic supply chain development around that. And then there's the, Follow on, well, what if consumers just don't buy those many, that many cars? Um, and you look at many, uh, some OEMs are waiting to see what happens before they really commit to producing all EVs. And some are all in, we're only gonna do EVs. Um, and that sort of prisoner's dilemma scenario where some are going to win and some are gonna lose in that transition, um, it's gonna make for a very interesting market environment and a very interesting consumer behavior environment. And if it doesn't go the way you want it to go, 
will we have to mandate or not? And how will technology grow around it? So I, I think it's just a massive, wicked, like under n underappreciated, but massive issue. We're so we're so easy to see the hockey stick of adoption of this technology and believe it will for sure happen. And so far, so good. But who knows? So with that, there were many hard questions that came in. I'm actually going to, uh, I think we could work with Valerie to put together a longer article where we address some of those questions. So they'll all be archived. Thank you for those questions. And with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Ernie the mic and let him have the last few minutes. Thank you to our panelists. You want to go to the podium? Well, I would have preferred to have heard a few more questions, actually, of the panel. But anyway, um, uh, I'm not going to, first of all, I can assure you, I'm not going to repeat what's been uh, uh, said. Uh, but I do want to start by thanking, again, the, the Scott Institute and, and Carnegie Mellon for, uh, for the hospitality to have us, to give us the chance to discuss uh, our thinking along these, uh, along these lines and, uh, and get some feedback. These questions are themselves uh, interesting, interesting feedback. Um, I was going to make a few comments. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, actually, Valerie in that last round uh, uh, emphasized the regulatory work that's needed. In fact, my sp the spirit of my comments here, as much as possible, is uh, I'm pocketing the next version of the case study and thinking now about what's the work to be done uh, going forward. And that regulatory work uh, is, is extremely important, uh, and not only in this region. But I, what I do want to say is uh, that I think there's a d little bit of a distinction between uh, the focus of the work in the carbon capture and sequestration world and the hydrogen world. Uh, the former uh, has enormous state responsibilities uh, in getting that straightened out, whereas the uh, really unformed hydrogen regulatory framework for hydrogen as an energy commodity, I think, is going to have a lot more federal uh, component, relatively speaking. Uh, and um, helping shape the latter, especially for, as I said earlier, a region where I think the Ohio River Valley uh, regional hydrogen hub idea is so salient can have huge benefits. Uh, for example, I think it was I think it was Steve uh, I forget maybe Steve who mentioned this question of the multi-state uh, footprint, and it would be refreshing in contrast to the history of, say, the oil and natural gas markets, to actually develop a regulatory framework, maybe somewhat in advance of the market formation, to help shape it. And to shape it in a way that does not have, uh, and, or the electricity markets, the, which uh, has the analog of the so-called Federal Policy Act, Power Act of the 1930s that continues to be a huge problem in terms of how state boundaries are treated for, um, for activities or commodities that have no idea where a state boundary is, um, but are regulated as though they have a label on them. So anyway, so I think that's a really important thing that uh, that could be. Uh, I mean, I think it needs research, and uh, and uh, and it needs research fast. Uh, I think to help uh, help shape that. On the multi-state issues, I would add uh, to it that there are in other domains, you know, things like multi-state compacts, and again, that may be a very interesting thing to explore. Uh, in this uh, in this uh, specific context, um, and could could um, open up a lot. One area where it could open up a lot, except the timing may not be quite right, to be honest, is uh, the infrastructure, again, the bipartisan infrastructure and reconciliation bills before Congress are a huge deal in the context of everything we've talked about today. Uh, and an enormous opportunity. And I would link that to the multi-state compact idea in terms of what could be a tremendous 
kind of competitive uh, advantage in in going forward. So lots of I think I think this this effort has really, at least in my mind, opened up big issues that need to be explored. And and uh, and an innovation asset like Carnegie Mellon, University of Pittsburgh, University of West Virginia, Ohio, et cetera, uh, could be very, very important there. Um, I think another uh, uh, issue really important, and this was alluded to, um, again, I'm not sure who, or maybe it was Steve, um, Capital, or maybe it was I forget who. Somebody mentioned capital for venture cap for venture at the venture stage. It was Steve? Okay, yeah. Um, but in this decade, and especially with this idea of jobs, etc., a lot of it is going to be we're talking about really big capital, uh, and. A lot of that's going to be from the banks from and, and other very, very deep pockets. Pension funds were mentioned earlier by, by someone, for example, equity funds. We can go on and on. But the question is, uh, in a period in which there remains a significant green premium for putting things in place, what are going to be the policies to provide the security and risk mitigation measures needed to unleash huge amounts of capital collectively beyond this region in the trillions, certainly in this region in the many, many billions of, of dollars for actual projects that that build the infrastructure build build the projects that are needed so again I think that's another kind of that's my punch list for all of you to work on uh, um, and and finally I'll just uh, add that um, in, a, in a somewhat different vein uh, that I go back to the word coalitions I mentioned earlier as being very very important and coalitions is related to again, a concept that uh, uh, for me came out very strongly in the Roosevelt Project and that is the uh, need for strong, a strong social fabric for success. And, uh, and, 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 and again, what that means is creating all the connective tissue from different kinds of organizations uh, in, the, uh, in the region uh, such that they are all uh, rowing in the same uh, in the same direction. The, there was a uh, there was a joke about a uh, small college that wanted to get into athletics and chose crew, and so they got an eight man shell, eight person shell, I should say, and uh, you know went out on the local body of water, timed themselves against uh, Harvard and Yale and realized, oh my God, this is terrible. We must have missed something. So they scouted uh, a Harvard practice, realized, oh my God, at Harvard, they got eight people rowing and only one person yelling. <laughs> and I think that's a very important lesson. <laughs> uh, uh, and. Uh, one that I think uh, will be very, very important for success here and elsewhere, of course, uh, in terms of uh, moving forward. So with that, again, thank you very much. Uh, we've had um, a very interesting ride for now about three years or so on this Roosevelt project, and, uh, and um, we've still got some work to do to get the case studies finalized, to pull them all together uh, in terms of a summary. So we started broad. We go to the case studies, and then we'll try to come back again and and uh, get some get some common lessons. And um, and I and our hope, of course, is that this will be useful specifically in those four case study regions. But then, of course, more broadly, uh, as other localities uh, look to make their own solutions uh, for the for the energy transition. Thank you very much. <laughs>